Brian Enquist. I'm a professor in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at the University of Arizona. I'm also external faculty at the, the Santa Fe Institute. And uh, my research mainly focuses on um, how to scale biological processes uh, in both uh, basic and, and applied biology, but also within ecology. Um, and so I'm really interested in how we can take uh, individual measures that we take on very small scales and then scale that up to, to larger scale patterns and processes. Uh, Three-fourths uh, scaling um, kind of stems you know, from very early observations that were made on how metabolic rate changes uh, with uh, the size of an animal. Um, so as you go from a very small animal, from something like a mouse or a shrew, all the way up to uh, an elephant or the blue whale, if you then record how much energy or food then that animal then needs, it's not in direct proportion to its body size. That is, if you double then the size then uh, of a mammal, you don't double the size of the food or double the, the metabolic requirements then of that animal. You actually uh, scale then the amount of resources uh, then uh, organisms need. In fact, you scale it to its size raised to the, the three-fourths power. And so this was a, a pattern that was, that was noted by uh, uh, Max Kleiber way back in the 1930s. And so a big question now has always been, well, why then do organismal rates and times actually scale uh, with uh, these exponents okay, that seem to cluster around uh, what we call quarter powers? And the uh, three over four scaling is a kind of a classic example of that. Yeah, so, so um, I'm presuming you know a little bit about what, what, what fractals are, but, but effectively, you know, uh, you think of uh, kind of a fractal type process is basically taking an algorithm and iterating it over and over and over again. Um, and so, um, so in thinking about these quarter power scaling relationships, so if you, as you either increase in size going from baby as you develop then into an adult, or if you compare small animals with big ones, if we measure any biological rates and times, their physiology, how fast they run, the size of their, uh, of, of, uh, their uh, uh, population densities, we, we see these scaling relationships kind of emerge over and over again. And so, so it was really intriguing, um, but we kind of lacked more of a unified theoretical framework, uh, more or less a unified theory for the origin of biological scaling relationships. And so the thought is that ultimately, it has all these scaling relationships in biology ultimately uh, kind of boil down to what limits the rate and pace of metabolism uh, within the body. And so the thinking is that it's ultimately the network um, that supplies resources to the metabolizing cells or these vascular networks that, um, that ultimately are controlling the scaling then of metabolism. And so the thought then here is that that network then should be under um, a Quite a bit of uh, selective uh, pressures. So evolution by natural selection then has uh, kind of the argument is that evolution by natural selection has designed then these networks to be on the one hand optimal, um, uh, in in that uh, these optimal networks then maximally supply resources to the metabolizing cells, but yet at the same time try to do that uh, as efficiently as possible. And so what I mean by that is that the cost of moving resources then through this network is then minimized. So you have a maximization and a minimization and this sweet spot in the middle in terms of what these networks should look like. And so uh, once one does the math, uh, out pops out a specific kind of flavor of a, of a vascular network that should have very specific properties of branching. And what's very interesting is that with these, ne uh, with these optimal networks, if you look at the flow rate then of resources through the network, as a function of the size of the network, out pops out these quarter power scaling relationships. So it's not just the, the scaling of then uh, the resource then flux then through the network, but out pops out a lot of other scaling relationships having to do with the morphology and the design then of that network itself. Okay, and so what's actually really cool is that um, your body is effectively one big network, right? So you have a cardiovascular system, you know, within you. You have a neural system, you know, within you. You have a series of these different then networks that are not only distributing resources but also information then through you. And so, um, so our work then is effectively kind of aimed at understanding kind of uh, how you scale these networks and how uh, central then these networks are for for the scaling of rates and times in biology. Yeah, so it at least provides um, a theoretical prediction then for why we would expect to see scaling relationships in biology. 
and it's based then on the first principles of network design, but also how natural selection then has acted then to um, shape then the kind of the geometry um, of these networks. Yeah, so, so the other really intriguing thing about biological scaling relationships is that we see these scaling relationships within individuals. So for example, you know, as you, as you grow from a baby to an adult, you, uh, your, your body is scaled, your body dimensions, your physiology will all scale then with your, with your size. And then we see it between species. But then the really cool thing is that if when we look at within ecological systems, so for example, I, I tend to study forests, and so if I look then at the distribution of trees then within a forest, or then as you, I go from a low biomass um, uh, 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 a forest to a high biomass forest, and I look then at how rates and times then change as I go from um, low biomass to high biomass, or as we go from the small trees to the big trees within a forest, we see that all these ecological and more ecosystem rates also scale. So not only do we see these, you know, the, the, the scaling of energy and metabolism, the metabolism then within individuals then scaling, we can also make equivalent measures at the ecosystem level of the ecosystem metabolism and the, the processing of, uh, of energy and nutrients then within ecosystems. We also find that those then scale. And the really intriguing thing is that a lot of those scaling relationships are effectively identical to the scaling relationships then that we see then within individuals. And so what we've been trying then to do is link up and understand how the scaling then uh, within individuals then ramify and scale up to then influence these, uh, the processing, uh, processing of energy then and matter within ecosystems. And so that's what I find actually really exciting is that we're then using then these really basic allometric or these scaling relationships in individuals to then make predictions about entire ecosystems. Well, to be brutally honest with you, when I was an undergraduate, I took a zoology class, okay? And it was unlike any other biology class that I had. That is, instead of learning you know, like all these different terms, you know, about, you know, this is the, you know, the name of this bone or for this tissue, you have a specific, you know, uh, way of describing it or classifying it. Um, my teacher taught the zoology class from a purely comparative point of view, and he put up these allometric or these scaling relationships and it blew me away that despite the diversity of life that there is out there I mean you just think about it going from mice to elephants you know from seedlings to redwoods right that you can describe very complicated phenomena with very simple mathematical relationships right so these scaling functions and you can describe them you know as, as, as a pure kind of a, a power law and so that blew me away that here you are within biology, and, and as you learn biology, it's very complicated. There's a lot going on, but yet there's this kind of like this underlying essence of simplicity or uh, an underlying truth. You know, that, and I just couldn't believe that, uh, that that was indeed the case. And so that just really kind of, uh, kind of piqued my interest in um, scaling within biology, uh, in particular within the origin of these allometric relationships. And so it was actually the notion that you could go from biology and then translate that into math, which just seemed beautiful to me, you know, and, uh, and I've just been hooked ever since. Well, you know, um, well, I, I think, I mean, in general, I mean, math is the most powerful way that we can think about nature. Okay. Um, you know, math enables us to not only codify what we see, okay, but it enables us to very precisely communicate you know, between each other in terms of what we're seeing and what we're measuring. Right? And so I really do think that, that math in terms of our cognitive skills is the purest essence of kind of reason and uh, communication. And um, and it's really too bad that oftentimes when uh, in kind of basic kind of primary math education that that beauty and that essence of, of communication isn't really taught. You know, it's more of, uh, you know, the hard slog of learning algebra or pre-calc you know, pre or, you know, advanced calculus, right? Instead of more of the beauty and the power you know, of it. Well, I mean, I, I think there, there's always been a push, you know, uh, you know, for biology to become, to be a little bit more formally integrated into the hard physical, you know, sciences. But there's also a lot of resistance as well. 
one thing that I worry about is that um, even though there, I mean, you'll see a lot of math and various talks and things, but what worries me is always the, um, I think there's a very strong pull to bring the supposed complexity um, of biology into the complexity of the math and the models. And I think what's missing is more of the emphasis on trying to distill the complexity down you know, to its most simple kind of like basic truths. And so just because you can mathematize something um, doesn't necessarily mean you should be, right? And so a very complicated model, you know, to me, it may ultimately be the ultimate kind of like explanation, the ultimate truth, but one should always try to simplify the math, you know, as much as possible and to simplify, you know, the system that you study. So, so I think it's an inevitable, well, I think it's great, you know, that, that now there's, there's more kind of mathematical approaches you know, within biology, but I think we should also, you know, try to, you know, follow more the, the heat of, uh, uh, um, more of the, um, uh, the, the essence of trying to distill then the math down ultimately to the more simple, you know, components instead of making it more complicated. Thank <laughs> you.